Good morning, beloved. Peace be with you. Today, as we said, we are in the first Sunday of Advent, a new season. And uh, so our first, really, the, this is our beginning of our new year. You can make some New Year's resolutions if you want with the Lord. Uh, or you can wait a couple more weeks, huh? And uh, it's always good to start over and make good resolutions. We have, as you, we know, we, always, we switch our colors to purple. And remember, just remind us, purple is always that sign of preparation. We put on purple because pre- it's a season of preparation. And Lent, Advent, we know, is preparing us for, uh, really, for the second coming of Jesus. This is a, a season we're preparing for the second coming of Jesus. And we do that by entering into and celebrating his first coming. And so, that, um, and so that's what we're mostly seeing in our scriptures today, this uh, right away going after some signs that Jesus gives us to recognize uh, his second coming. <clears throat> now, he, now we know um, in between his first coming in the flesh and the second coming in the flesh, he s- still comes to us, huh? <laughs> right? He doesn't abandon us or leave us orphans. He comes to us in the Eucharist. Every time we celebrate and worship together, he comes to us in presence in his spirit. Every time we gather together or even are just praying, worshiping him, singing songs of praise and worship in our rooms or uh, in the park or wherever. You know, so Jesus is coming to us all the time in his presence. Uh, and and um, there's also times when Jesus is coming. Um, <clears throat> So today he says this gospel passage is all about signs to recognize when he comes in his presence, in his power, and in his great glory. How to recognize him when he comes in his presence, power, and great glory. So there's times when he comes in history, we see, when it's not the, now we're going to go, we're going to get a little deep today, huh? I hope you got your coffee going, your thinking caps. So there's times when Jesus comes, um, so, uh, in history, not at the end of all time or at the end of the world, but at the end of the world as we know it. You know, there's times in, our, in, in history of humanity when the, when the world as they knew it ended. And, and you know, things changed. Governmental structures changed. The economy changed. Things changed. Like that, that, the world as they knew it ended and kind of a new world began. Just a couple easy examples, huh? There was a time in here in North America when these were not, it was not these 50 United States, huh? This didn't always exist, right? There was a time something else, some other structure existed before this. And in order for this to exist, that, that world came to an end. And then this one began. And we know all things pass away. So at some point in time, these 50 United States will not exist. This governmental structure will not exist. It too will come to an end. The world as we know it will end here and it will change to something else. Maybe not in our lifetime, but we know it will. Uh, Just the days that the Roman Empire, as Jesus knew it in the gospel, that's ended, huh? That world has come to an end as they know it. And a new structure has taken over. So there are times in history when the world as we know it comes to an end. And at those times, Jesus is coming. Jesus comes in his spirit, in his power, in his great glory at those times as well. So we can apply our passage today not just to the end of all time or the end of the world at the end of time, but at the end of the world as we know it. Anytime these things shift and change in history. So these, these signs help us to recognize Christ coming uh, in his presence, power, and great glory. So, and uh, now to, to dive in, we're just going to dive in, break it open. This is all, he using, Jesus is using apocalyptic language, so we have to kind of decipher some things. And this is just a small passage if you this actually, read the whole chapter of Luke 21. That chapter is actually Jesus. Jesus is kind of short version of the entire book of Revelations. Did you know that? So, so, so this chapter is a short version of the entire book of Revelations. And this, chap, this passage we have here today is just one little part you know, of that book as well. So we'll pull from the Revelations. We'll pull from the other Gospels like Matthew 
in order to get more details and just dive in so we can know what this apocalyptic imagery and symbolism is telling us, pointing to. I tell you, we're going to get deep. Hang on. Who had coffee? I, only, I, I had two. I wanted to have three. So I, I need, I'm going to need Holy Spirit help. Okay. So remember, though, we're looking at... Jesus is giving us signs to recognize his coming. Signs that his presence is here. His power is here. That his great glory and honor is here. The first sign Jesus gives us, he says, is that there will be, he said, there'll be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. It doesn't really say very much, huh? But if we go to Matthew, Matthew gives more details. Matthew actually says the, sun, the sign of the sun and the moon will be an eclipse. There will actually be an eclipse of the sun. If we go to Revelation, so this section of Revelations, Revelations actually describes a blood moon eclipse. You seen a blood moon eclipse? Pretty cool, I think. Okay, so, the, and, and Matthew tells us that the, star, the sign of the stars is that the stars will be falling. So we've seen shooting stars, falling stars. So, you know, you, this could be literal interpretation. Those things may happen at that time as well. And it can all, there can also be figurative interpretation along with that. So just look at it and think about it for a moment. If the sun and the moon are eclipsed and there's, there's darkness... And the stars are falling, so basically they're saying the sun, the moon, and the stars, the things that bring, give us light on this world are going to be dark. So figuratively, figuratively speaking, it's telling us this is going to be a time of darkness, right? Not too hard yet, huh? Now, next we can look at there will be signs in the sun, moon, and the stars. The moon will be eclipsed, or the sun will be eclipsed by the moon. There will be darkness. Stars will be falling. We can look at, in the scriptures, anytime we see this, com this combination and comparison between things in heaven and things on earth, it usually points to um, godly people and ungodly people, God's people and pagans, or believers and unbelievers, uh, godly people, heavenly people, worldly people. And so we see that combination here. First, Jesus tells us what's going to happen in heaven. Then he says what's going to happen on earth. So this, is so this can point then to a deeper sign that shows us that basically if the sun and the moon are dark and the stars are falling, it's saying the righteous, righteous people of God are falling from grace into sin. Right? It's our job to shine the light of Christ in the world. But if the light of Christ is going out... That means it's because righteous people are falling from grace into sin. The sun and the moon are like the, those are like the primary light sources, huh? Well, I know the moon's not a light source, okay, but just saying. But these are, so this is, would point to then leaders. You could just say leaders in the churches. Leaders in God's church are falling from grace into sin. Their light is going out. And stars, other, other laity, other Christian people, their light is going out. They are falling from grace into sin. That's the first sign. That believers are falling from grace into sin. The second sign, so that's what's happening within heaven, in the heavens and with the heavenly people. The second sign Jesus gives us here, he says, now on earth, earthly people, they will be in dismay perplexed, they will be so full of fear, they're dying of fear. That's what, that's what the worldly people are going to be acting like. Now we know what it's like, uh, we have a little taste, what it's like to be so afraid that you're dying. How many people during COVID have been so afraid of dying that they stopped living? <laughs> They stopped going outside the house. They stopped going to the store. They stopped visiting family and friends. They stopped socializing. They stopped living because they were afraid to die. That's what Jesus is giving a taste of. People on earth, they will be dying of fear. And why are they dismayed? Why are they dying of fear? Why are they perplexed? The third sign is because the roaring of the sea and the waves. 
We know in biblical symbolism, the sea always is a place where evil is. Remember when Jesus cast out the legion of demons, they went into the swine, and the swine went into the sea. In the book of Revelations, it's from the sea where the evil beasts, the, these evil demonic presences come forth to terrorize the earth. Out of the sea comes the evil. This is why it's so important to see Jesus walking on the sea. Huh? He's more powerful than he's over the sea. He can calm the storms of the sea. He controls and calms and, uh, the, the demonic presences. If the sea, if evil, if demonic presence is roaring, well, what's that look like? That means evil is becoming more public and more bold. Evil doesn't have to hide anymore. Corruption doesn't have to hide anymore. It can, it's just public and arrogantly bold about it. Like, what are you going to do? Because there's no consequences. Have you ever seen evil grow and become public and bold and arrogant like that? So that's the third sign. First sign, the righteous, many righteous people will fall from grace into sin. Second sign, the, the worldly people or unbelievers will be overwhelmed. They'll be in dismay, perplexed, and, and full of fear, so fearful that they're dying of fear. Third sign is they'll see evil becoming public and bold, roaring. The fourth sign, Jesus says, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. So the powers in with, with God's heavenly people will be shaken up. So think of shaken, like think of an earthquake. And when an earthquake shakes the world, shakes the ground, whatever's not on a, built on a firm foundation crumbles. Well, when God is shaking up the heavens and heavenly people, he's shaking up the church, He's transferring his presence and his power and his authority from the righteous who have fallen to the righteous who will give him the glory he deserves. Let me give you an image of that. Think of, in the Old Testament, King Saul and David. You know the story of King Saul and David? So King Saul, he, he was anointed by God to be king and had God's presence and his blessing and his favor and then there came a time when Saul uh, fell from grace it said he fell from grace and the prophet Samuel had to go and correct him and tell him you you have done some, uh, a very terrible thing basically not just a little mini sin huh you've actually fallen from grace in such a way he said that God is now going to remove from you the kingship and give it to another. He's going to remove from you his presence and give it to another. He's going to remove from you his power and authority and give it to another who is more worthy than you. And that's what he, and, and it said that God took his presence from Saul and gave it to David. And his power and authority from Saul and his favor and gave it to David. And when God removed his presence from King Saul, it says that a demonic presence came in and began to terrorize him and oppress him and even influence him to try to kill David many times out of jealousy because he knew David had God's presence with him and he no longer had God's presence with him. That's God shaking up the heavenly powers, transferring the heavenly powers. Now, the hard thing there is you recognize even though, even though God transferred the power and this present and his favor and his blessing from Saul to David, Saul was still the king. Huh? Civilly, structurally, church speaking, Saul was still the king, even though David had God's blessing to, and anointing as the, and, and kingship. There, had, there still was this waiting period for what God had already done in the spirit to be worked out in the flesh, for David to become the king. And so what that means for us, when we see this fourth sign, it will mean as we see 
the, the righteous people, some righteous people of God falling from grace, righteous you know, leaders in the church falling from grace into sin. It means that God, when he shakes up the heavens, he will transfer the favor, the blessing, his presence he's given to them and give it to someone else who will honor him and glorify him and stay in grace with him. But even when God shakes up the heavens and transfers those things to somebody else, those people will still remain. For a time, they will still remain structurally in the leadership of the church. And could we say, just as God removed his presence from Saul and gave it to David, and when he removed his presence, a demonic presence came in and took that place, that space, so too when God removes his presence from church leaders who fall from grace, a demonic presence may come in and take up that space and begin to torment those leaders, oppress them, and even influence them to do evil like they did Saul. You hear what I'm saying here? Does this explain anything? (laughs) We see. This is all biblical. So how do we know? Who would we follow at that time? How do we know? Who we follow? Who's got God's presence? Who's got God's blessing? Who's got God's authority? Where God has transferred all those things to? I'll tell you in a minute. First, Jesus wants us to to remember that these are that while all those things are happening, while the righteous are falling from grace into sin, and the people on earth are dying of, for, of fear and perplexity and dismay, and to, they're all distressed, overwhelmed by they're watching too much news. And while evil is becoming more and more bold and public and arrogantly public, it doesn't have to hide anymore. And while the powers of heaven are being being shaken up and, and, and powers are being transferred, while all that's happening. Here's the good news. Jesus is coming. Right? When, when all these things are happening, that's when you will see the Son of Man coming in his, it says, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. The cloud is always a symbol of God's presence, of God's Holy Spirit. So when you and I see all that junk happening, That's when we stand up erect and rejoice. Jesus is coming. His presence is here. His power is here. His great glory is here. It's it's easy for us to recognize kind of evil and bad things happening. Oh, and people sin and all the, the, you know, this person is doing that, that person is doing this. But do we also at the same time as easily recognize the presence of Jesus growing? When evil is getting more and more bold publicly, so is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is getting more and more bold publicly. That's what Jesus is telling us. So, you know, when people are falling from grace, there's people rising to new higher levels of grace. There's people that were, they're so full of fear, perplexity, distress, anxiety, and yet there's also people so full of the Holy Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience. At the same time, They're all happening at the same time. And Jesus wants us to recognize all those things happening. We recognize the presence of God growing, the Spirit of God growing. Do we recognize Jesus coming in his presence and his power and with his great glory? So these are all signs that Jesus is coming in his presence, his spirit, his power, his great glory. How do we know when the powers have been shaken and transferred, who is with God and who is not? It's the group and the people who are giving God honor and glory. That's where his presence will be found. Wherever God is honored, wherever God is being glorified, that's where you'll see Jesus coming in his presence and his spirit and with his power. Right? Jesus comes and says in great glory, 
Glory is not something that, it's not, a, it's not a, like something he has. It's something that's given to him. You know, if I, if I honor somebody, I pull them up here and I say, we want to honor this person today for this, that, and the other thing. We're, we give the honor, right? So honor and glory is something that we give to God. And when we honor him and glorify him, here he comes in his presence with his spirit, with his power. And so that's how you know where the powers and his presence and his favor and his blessing have been, have been transferred and shifted. Whatever you see, people glorifying God. Whoever is giving God great glory in that place, in those people, in that family, in that parish, you will see that the greater the glory rises, the greater the glory that's given, the greater of God's presence will be manifest the greater his Holy Spirit will be manifest in that place. The greater his power will grow in that place. Power to heal, power to deliver and bring freedom, power to bring peace on earth when everybody else is, is uh, full of fear. This is, by the way, one of the main signs we have to be able to recognize giving God the glory in our life, and who else is giving God the glory? Because that's where his presence and his power is, and his favor is found. We have to be able to recognize that because Revelation tells us that the end of times, when the Antichrist comes, whoever's alive at that time, that Antichrist will also be doing the same signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus did. That Antichrist will also have some kind of a powerful presence. And because it has some kind of powerful presence and it's doing the same signs, wonders, and miracles that Jesus did and that the people of God are doing, it says he will draw many people away from God and after him. He will deceive many, it says. Many righteous will fall from grace, will apostatize, will leave because they got fooled. So when the Antichrist is doing the same signs, wonders, and miracles that the people of God are doing with the Holy Spirit, how do you recognize the difference? Who is glorifying God? That's the one. Where is God's glory found? Where are the people glorifying and honoring God? Where is the parish that's honoring and glorifying God? Where is the group that's honoring and glorifying God? That's where the authentic presence of God is. That Antichrist is not going to give honor to God, not going to glorify God. He's going to draw glory and honor to himself. This is how we know where to follow, where, who, who we follow, who we listen to. When we're testing every spirit like Paul tells us to, you, part of the testing is, is it in the Bible? Part of the testing is, how does it feel in my spirit when I'm in prayer with God? Part of the testing is, where is the glory? Who is giving God honor? Who is giving God glory in their life, in their home, in their family, in their parish, in their community of friends or work? Where you find God's glory visibly, you will find God's presence tangibly. You know, when people walk into our houses, is it obvious that in this house I honor God? Our faith is personal, but it's not private, not meant to be private. Is it obvious to people that we honor God, that we glorify God first and foremost in our life? That we seek to please him first and foremost or ourself? This is also gives you good, easy examples. You want more of God's presence in your life? Glorify him more in your life. You want more of God's power to heal, deliver, and bring peace on earth? Give God more glory. How do you and I honor the presence of God we have right now in our life? How are we honoring God's presence right now in our life? How do we honor, how are we practically honoring God's power right now in our life? His power for healing, his power for bringing freedom, his power for bringing peace. If we honor what he has given us, he will give us more. 
This is why he says, your job at the end here, when you see these things happening, when you see all the earth going crazy and people falling from grace to sin, and, but you also see my presence gr coming and growing in power and great glory, your job, my job, is to stand, stand erect. Raise your heads. Because your redemption is at hand. Better word for erect is upright. Stand upright. It means be in a right relationship with God. I'm looking up. Upright versus what, we, what, the, what happened to Cain in Genesis. Cain was crestfallen, huh? Like the moon, crestfallen, looking at his navel, looking at himself, right? Are we looking at ourselves or down here? Are we upright? Head is erect, upright, in right relationship with God. When everything else is going crazy around us and other righteous people around us have fallen from grace into sin, are you and I standing upright, giving God honor and the glory that are his? That's what Jesus is asking us to do when we see these things happen. When we see, when we see him coming, stand upright in that right relationship with God, no matter what's happening. We're going to stop right there. <laughs> Father, we dishonor you today for your presence with us, for your, the truth that you give to us spoken in Holy Scriptures, for the gift of your Son, Jesus, for your presence among us and your power for healing that you've already begun in this place. And we, as we honor you and glorify you, we ask you for more. You're a good Papa who has a lot of a lot of things, a lot of grace, a lot of love, a lot of presence. We want more of your presence in our life. So teach us how to honor you more and to glorify you more in a practical way in our lives and in our homes and especially in our parish community. We pray these things together in Jesus' name, amen. amen.